So um, let's begin. Are you ready? Sure. Would you like to guide us in a prayer? In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Good and gracious God, thank you for this opportunity of this Lenten season to grow in our faith, in our service to others, and especially to you. We ask this in the name of your Son, Jesus. Amen. 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 All right. Well, let's go and look at our readings right here. And you know what's what's uh, amazing is we have we have the readings from year A, we have the readings from year B. So right. there's a lot there's a lot of readings here. So maybe we'll just talk about the readings instead of sure. Uh, sure. reading through them. So that that way we can go through um, every single one of them. That's fair. And so the very first reading, you know, what's really interesting is uh, for the scrutinies, the readings really underline uh, the call of God, the vocation that we have, responding to the vocation that we have. Uh, and so you know, the very first reading is the call of Samuel. And, and I think that when we really read the, the, the um, it's not, I'm sorry, it's the anointing of David as king. It's so David receives his vocation as a king. And you know, you, you read the story about David, and God's, God says that God does not judge by appearance, but he looks at the heart. And, and David had a heart which was, was which desired to do God's will, unlike Saul, who disobeyed the Lord. So the Lord commanded Samuel to go to the town of Bethlehem. Jesse was David's father. The word Bethlehem, it means house of bread. And of course, the Messiah would be born in Bethlehem around a thousand years later. And so Jesse and his sons, they came out to meet the prophet. The prophet was, pre, you know, basically bringing a sacrifice. And this was a way of disguising what he was doing so that Saul wouldn't get word that he was anointing another king. And so Jesse came out, and Samuel the prophet looked at Eliab. Eliab means God is my father. Beautiful name. Samuel looked at him, and he said, surely the Lord's anointed is here. He thought that Eliab would be the king. And the Lord told him, do not judge from his appearance or his lofty stature, mm -hmm. because I have rejected him. Not as man sees does God see, because man sees the appearance. But the Lord looks into the heart. And it's it's amazing because David was one of eight brothers. And one by one, God had to reject each of his brothers before they finally found David. And what's interesting is Jesse did not even invite David to come. It was kind of like he wasn't even considered a possibility. And so there's something beautiful about that because once the Lord rejects all of Jesse's sons, Samuel says, you know, are these all the sons you have? Don't you have any more? Mm -hmm. And Jesse replies, there's still the youngest who is tending sheep. And it, and the youngest who was tending, tending the sheep, that was David. And what's interesting is David is taking care of sheep. He's shepherding sheep, and he will become a shepherd of the people. Moses was shepherding the flock of his father Jethro before he was called, and he became a leader or shepherd of the people. And something similar happens in the New Testament when Jesus calls his first apostles. He calls them from, from fishing to become fishers of men. So the concept of... Um, really leaving everything behind uh, or discovering God's vocation uh, in the midst of our work or the labors that we have. There's something beautiful in that. So, so what's interesting is there's a physical uh, description of David, and there's not many physical descriptions in the scriptures. And I, I think that one of the reasons why you have a physical description is because David is going to be outdone by his son in the future. Absalom, his son, will try to take the kingship away. And Absalom is described as being absolutely beautiful from head to toe. And so you have this short physical description of David. He's a young lad, though. And, and he's anointed. And what's, what's important here is that 
Samuel pours a horn of oil, a ram's horn called the shofar. He pours it over David in the presence of his brothers. His brothers are not even going to recognize his kingship. They're going to go and fight in the army of Saul right after this. But it says that he received the spirit of the Lord. The spirit of the Lord rushed upon David. Uh, and the, it, as it goes on, it says from that day forward. So David has the continual presence of the spirit of the Lord. Um, so there's a lot in this first reading regarding vocation, our calling, um, not being judged by others, God knowing our heart in the sense, in here the sense is not, we often use it in a um, kind of like idiomatic phrase with a different meaning. People say, God knows my heart. But what it means here in scripture is God looks at the heart. He knows that David has a desire to do his will, unlike Saul, who did not do his will. Um, so what do you think about this reading? Anything you would add here? You know, anything you would you would bring up if you were doing the scrutinies? I always I always look at the people when they're doing the scrutinies, they're always very nervous. Yeah. You know, and so so they're so I, I try to find good things to connect in the reading and with their own personal experience as well. Who who are we Lord let me see that. who are we not supposed to judge by their appearance? Mm. in this story mm -hmm. so Who's so Samuel, about? yeah samuel thought when he showed up he saw david's oldest son who was a big strong guy and the ancient israelites loved the concept of a warrior king okay. so he's looking at this big strong guy there and he's like perfect this is it and god says no nah, don't look at his you know, so he says, don't judge from his appearance or oh, lofty it. stature. Got it. You know, you, you want a warrior king, but you're going to get a young lad. Yes. So so Samuel is immediately judging. Jesse doesn't even think David's qualified and doesn't even invite him. Right. So both of them have, you know, they, they're they're looking at it from a very worldly standpoint. Okay. They, and and this is how they're viewing the king kingship. And of course, Jesus's kingship is a totally different kingship, right? And so Christ, you Christ. start to, you, yeah, exactly. You start to see uh, images of this in the Old Testament. So yeah. little yeah. by little, the the ideals that are Got connected it. with kingship. Yeah. Very good. Makes sense. Okay. Any other thoughts there? All right. And, you know, I, I love the fact that he was tending the sheep. Yes. They, had, they had to call him away from what he was doing to be able to um, be anointed. So the next, so the psalm is is a is Psalm twenty three. The Lord is my shepherd. Uh -huh. There's there's nothing I shall want. And you know, it's very common to proclaim this psalm during funerals. funerals. I think it's I think it's one of the most common funeral psalms. The Lord is my shepherd. There's nothing I shall want. And I I think it's appropriate because you know you know when at the moment of death, we realize that all that we have is the Lord. You know, that's that's all that we have. And so it's it's a I think it's it's a appropriate at funerals and gravesides. Very much so. Yeah. But the, the concept is that in the in the near ancient uh, ancient Near East, kings would liken themselves to be shepherds of the people, not just in Israel, but even around Israel. And so. So David, who is chosen as a shepherd of the people, he says, the Lord is my shepherd. Right. You know, so this, this is this is a beautiful image of a king who gives everything to the Lord. He understands that the true shepherd is the Lord, not himself. So there's really something humble about Psalm 23 that we might want to mention. Like David was chosen to be king. Nobody recognized him. And he's recognizing the true shepherd that I have is the Lord. Right. Uh, and so it, it tells us something about his character as well. There's a lot of beautiful metaphors in the in the psalm. They're metaphors of the spiritual life in verdant pastures. He gives me repose besides restful, restful waters. He leads me. He refreshes my soul. He guides me in right paths for his namesake. And even though I walk in the dark valley, I fear no evil for you are at my side. And really all the metaphors, if you look at the metaphors closely, they underline how close God is to us, how much he cares about us. 
And I think that that's the thing that I would share with every person making the scrutinies is that that in as you go through the scrutinies to really recognize how close the Lord is to you and how he he wants uh, each of us to recognize his closeness, even the most difficult moments of life uh, with your rod and your staff that give me courage. And then the image of banquet, you spread the table before me in the sight of my foes. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. I, the banquet images are are beautiful as, as well, especially if you really think about coming to the Eucharist. And sometimes we come to mass in the, in the midst of difficulties, troubles, problems. And then finally, only goodness and kindness follow me. The concept of following is a very profound concept in the Hebrew scriptures. It's it's a it's the verb is radaf, which means to pursue or persecute. And right. and it's the verb that describes the Pharaoh persecuting Israel, running after them to try to kill them. And in Psalm 23, it's saying, with with the Lord as my shepherd, only goodness and kindness come after me or follow me. So it's like all of all of these evils are taken away. Um, it's a beautiful image of of the spiritual life. All right. Any other thoughts on at Psalm twenty three? At funerals or vigils or even rosaries, I'm almost always have the people, especially if they're not connected to the church, and you know many of them aren't, to repeat that that psalm out loud with me. Mm. Especially the Lord is my shepherd; there is nothing I shall want. And when they say it that many times, hopefully it's connecting at a very difficult time for me. So. That's beautiful. It is true. Well, All right. Yes. Let's go to Psalm. And let's go now to uh, the second reading. It's from Ephesians chapter 5. And I love Ephesians chapter 5 because it talks about marriage. And, and so just before Paul talks about marriage in Ephesians chapter 5, he talks about our conduct and the way that we treat one another. So this is very good advice for the home, for family. And so he says, brothers and sisters, you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Live as children of light, for light produces every kind of goodness and righteousness and truth. Try to learn what is pleasing to the Lord. Take no part in the fruitless works of darkness. Rather, expose them. For it is shameful even to mention the things done by them in secret. And, you know, a lot of times people, they they like to get into gossip or, oh, you wouldn't believe what this person did. Let me tell you. Oh, And here's Paul saying, don't even get into that. It's, it's, it's even shameful to mention some of these things. Stay away from them. But everything exposed by the light becomes visible. For everything that becomes visible is light. Therefore, it says... Awake, O sleeper, and rise from the dead, and Christ will give you new light. So this reading has some similarities with the first reading, especially the concept of discovering a vocation, having a new calling. Paul is talking to the Ephesians, and he's helping them to turn away from sinful activity. And once again, this is great for the scrutinies, because the church is inviting them to live a new life in Christ. And, th and with joy, we should, we should realize that we're turning away from the slavery of sin. We're turning away from the darkness of sin, but we're also turning to something. We're turning to th this new life that we have in Christ. And so as we turn away, we turn to. And so Paul, Paul quotes these words, Awake, O sleeper, and rise from the dead, and Christ will give you light. And in this way, he's telling the, the Ephesians, to turn away from every form of darkness in their own life. Any thoughts? The, the imagery of darkness and light are always powerful. You know, yeah. and, and we experience in our liturgical life during mm -hmm. uh, Lent and especially during the Triduum. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, people, under, people understand that, you know, darkness Absolutely. and light. All right. So then we now we have this long gospel about the man <laughs> born blind. And, you know, the one thing about the scrutinies, I guess the most difficult thing about the scrutinies is how much time will, will there be to preach the word of God? You know, and that's <laughs> that's probably that's really yeah. I guess that's the biggest um, dilemma that we have with the scrutinies is that that we have these long gospels 
And it doesn't always leave us a lot of time to preach the word of God. But the one thing I will say about the man born blind is there's really a process in his conversion. He He's healed by Jesus, but he's never seen Jesus. So, so the process is the process of his next encounter with Jesus. First, he's healed, and then he finally encounters Christ. And, and, and what's so beautiful about it is that he actually is healed by Jesus. He doesn't know who the one is who healed him. And he's persecuted and really thrown out of the synagogue. And once he's at the low point of his life, that's where Jesus encounters him a second time. Isn't that amazing? So, yes. you know, there's really, there's really something beautiful here about the journey of faith. It's not easy to live the faith. The first time he was healed, there were still so many things he had to understand about Jesus. And then he finally encounters the Lord at the end of the gospel. So there's a lot of theological questions in this reading, too. Uh, the first one is, Rabbi, who sinned this man or his parents that he was born blind? And so why is this man blind? You know, was is it the result of sin? Uh, is it or is it something he did? Or mm -hmm. was he, you know, was it something his parents did? Yes. You know, and Jesus is saying, neither he nor his parents sinned. It was so that the works of God might be made visible through him. And so it's really something amazing if you think about it. You don't have to point the blame at, it, at everyone. This was kind of the situation with Job and his three friends, if you remember the story of Job. And so, yeah, yeah. yeah. And so, so he makes, what's also interesting is he makes clay with his saliva and he smears the clay on the eyes of the man who's blind. And there's a lot of imagery there, sacramental imagery, you know, and also the image of like mud being put on his eyes, an image of our own sinfulness and blind and blindness. And he says, go wash in the pool of Siloam. Siloam, which means scent. And so he goes and he washes and he's able to see. It reminds us of a great miracle in the Old Testament when the Lord, through the prophet Elisha, he healed Naaman, the commander of the Syrian army. That was the reading actually today, Monday. And it's in 2 Kings chapter 5, where Naaman, who had leprosy, was told to go wash in the Jordan seven times. So you see some similarities, thematically similarities in this miracle and the healing of Naaman. So what's really interesting is, though, after he's healed, people don't really recognize him. His neighbors and those who had seen him earlier as a beggar said, isn't this the one who used to sit and beg? Yeah. And some <laughs> some said it is, but others said, no, he just looks like him. Couldn't be. <laughs> yeah. And he said, I am. So they said to him, how were your eyes open? And he replies, the man called Jesus made clay and anointed my eyes and told me, go to Siloam and wash. And so I went there and washed, and I was able to see. And they said to him, where is he? And he said, I don't know. There's a little bit of humor here because he never <laughs> really saw Jesus. He just knows that Jesus did this. So the, the humor underlines a little bit of our faith. We, we've never seen physically the Lord, but, but we know he's present. We've seen his work in our lives. We've experienced it firsthand. So there's something beautiful here. And so they brought the one who was once blind to the Pharisees, and Jesus Jesus had made the clay to open his eyes on the Sabbath. So now they're going to, you know, maybe accuse him of something. And, and they're questioning him, and he's telling them, he put clay in my eyes, and I washed, and now I see. And so some of the Pharisees said, this man is not from God because he does not keep the Sabbath. And so really it's a misunderstanding of the Sabbath. You know, the, the real understanding of the Sabbath is that all things would be restored. And in that way, we would understand the very significance of the Sabbath. Because in the first Sabbath, everything was perfect. And now because of sin, we have this disorder and corruption and problems. And to restore all things would underline the very significance of what the Sabbath was. And so the fact that they're accusing him for doing a healing on the Sabbath, it's really ironic, to say the least. And so... You know, another thing they say is, how can a sinful man do such signs? In John's gospel, remember Jesus' miracles, they're all called signs, okay? It yep. reminds us of it reminds us of Moses in Exodus who did signs. And so 
you know, what does the man say? The man says he is a prophet. And the Jews, now the Jews did not believe that he had been blind and gained his sight until they summoned the parents of the one who had gained his sight. Let's and then ask they asked them, <laughs> yeah, ask his parents, is this your son who, who you say was born blind? How does he, how does he now see? And his parents answered and said, we know that this is our son and that he was yep. born blind, but yep. we do not know how he sees. And you know, it's kind of funny when you read it because you can see like, they're really trying not to say anything that's going to get them in trouble here. Cause they, they already know. We don't want to say anything good about Jesus. No. And this is the society that we live in today where sometimes we feel like we're not allowed to say anything good about Jesus in many places in our world. We want to and sanitize so, it. <laughs> yeah. So what's exactly. So we know that this is our son, okay? But we don't know how his eyes got open. Ask him. He's of age. So I love this one right here. Why don't you ask him? We're not we don't even want to be involved. We want to be completely indifferent to this. And that's really what has happened in many ways in our world. There's this kind of indifference where people, they don't want to suffer, be made fun of, be rejected for the gospel. So his parents said this because they were afraid of the Jews. And they had already acknowledged that if anyone acknowledged Christ as Jesus as the Christ, they would be expelled from the synagogue. So for this reason, his parents said this. So a second time they called the man who had been born blind and said to him, give God the praise. We know that this man is a sinner. And he replied, if he is a sinner, I do not know. One thing I do know is that I was blind and now I see. see. So they said to him, what did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? He answered them, told you already and you did not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you want to become his disciples too? So they're, you can see that the blind guy, he's pretty courageous if you think about it. He's, hes I mean, he's not afraid to offend them with his questions. Do you want to become his disciples too? And so they ridiculed him. You are that man's disciple. We are disciples of Moses. We know that God spoke to Moses, but we do not know where this one is from. The man answered and said to them, this is what is so amazing, that you do not know where he is from, yet he opened my eyes, and we know that God does not listen to sinners. But if one is devout and does his will, he listens to him. It is unheard of that any that anyone ever opened the eyes of a blind, of a person born blind. Mm -hmm. If this man were not from God, he would not be able to do anything. And so they answered and said to him, You were born totally in sin, and you were trying to teach us, and they threw him out. So he yep. the moment that he gets thrown out, right there, that's the moment that he encounters Jesus a second time. So when Jesus heard that they had thrown him out, he found him and said, do you believe in the son, son of man? And he said, who is he, sir, that I may believe in him? And Jesus said, you have seen him. The one speaking with you is he. And he said, I do believe, Lord. And he worshiped him. So I, I really like this moment because you, there's a process here. The blind man has to go through a lot of stuff. And when he goes through all this, this stuff, he... You know, he he finally encounters Jesus a second time. And and there's there's something so beautiful about that. He encounters Christ a second time. Um, but in and but it's only after he's persecuted. And sometimes that happens in our own lives that when we go through a great trial in our own lives, we rediscover the beauty of the Lord's presence in our lives. So anything else that you want to say about this this passage here, uh, Deacon Frank, before we well, finish? I notice, I notice they have a short version, too. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, if I you know. Want to that's, that's, out. I don't like those, but. Yeah, I, I know. I, I understand why, because there's so much going on with the scrutinies. Yeah, I know. And it makes it hard to preach, you know, preach that long. But here's that that whole image of light, darkness and light. Now, again, you can the whole all through scriptures. And now he's he sees, and that's a, it's an amazing, it's a good connection for us all. Yes, absolutely. All right. Well, great. Well, let's go now to uh, wait. So we did the the readings for year A, which are always right. proclaimed for the for the scrutinies, and now so at most of our masses we will have the readings for year B, and so the very first reading from year B 
It comes from Second Chronicles chapter 36. And, and you don't get a lot of readings from Second Chronicles. Let's just say that, right? But I don't so know them might, at all. <laughs> yeah, you might you might even ask yourself, like, why in the world would the church ever put a reading from Second Chronicles during Lent? I would expect this on a weekday, you know, um, when your right. daily mass goers will listen to it. But there's really a reason here that's very profound. Second Chronicles, it underlines all the sins that took place before the city of Jerusalem was destroyed and the temple was destroyed. And then how God finally brought his people back from exile into the land after they were out of the land for 70 years. So when you read this reading, you know, it sounds gruesome in a sense. In those days, all the princes of Judah and the priests yeah. and the people added they added infidelity upon Holy. infidelity, Whoa. practicing abominations, polluting the Lord's temple, which he had consecrated in Jerusalem. So it's it's rough. And essentially, when, when we look at back and see the mistakes that were made by prior generations, we can more easily understand our own mistakes. Uh, and so, it, it, so in a certain sense, it's like the church is saying, look back at all they did before Jerusalem was destroyed. And now examine your life. And it goes on, it says, early and often did the Lord, the God of their fathers, send his messengers to them. Those are the prophets. For he had compassion on his people and his dwelling place. But they mocked the messengers of God. They basically rejected his prophets. They despised his warnings. They scoffed at his prophets until the anger of the Lord against his people was so inflamed that there was no remedy. Their enemies burnt the house of God and tore down the walls of Jerusalem and set all its palaces on fire. So this all happened in 587 B.C. when Jerusalem was completely leveled. They destroyed all its precious objects. Those who escaped the sword were carried captive to Babylon. And so the ones who did not die, they went to Babylon, to the Babylonian Empire, where they became mm -hmm. servants of the king of the Chaldeans. The Chaldeans are a, a, a name for the peoples that lived in this empire and his sons until the kingdom of the Persians came to power. So they were literally in Babylon from 587 to 539. And then finally, the Persians in 539 BC conquered the Babylonians, and Jews were able to go back and rebuild the temple. And they finally rededicated it around 517 BC. And all, all of this was to fulfill the word of the Lord spoken by Jeremiah until the land had retrieved its lost Sabbaths. So, so essentially, the concept of lost Sabbaths, the exile was uh, 70 years long. And if you do the math, 70 years means that there's 490 Sabbaths. So basically, Second Chronicles explained that they broke the Sabbath for 490 years consecutively. That's kind of what the idea is. Um, and so... Until the land retrieved its lost Sabbaths during during all the time it lies in waste, it shall have rest while 70 years are fulfilled. In the first year of Cyrus, the king of Persia, uh, I'm sorry, in the first year, first year of Cyrus, the king of Persia, in order to fulfill the word of the Lord spoken by Jeremiah, the Lord inspired King Cyrus of Persia to issue this proclama proclamation throughout his kingdom, both by word of mouth and in mm. writing. Thus says Cyrus, the king of Persia, all the kingdoms of the, of, of the earth, the Lord, the God of heaven, is given to me. And he has also charged me to build him a house in Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Whoever, therefore, among you belongs to any part of his people, let him go up and may his God, may his God be with him. So what, so what actually happened is Cyrus... He allowed the exiles to return. Some scholars think that this was a way for Cyrus to um, gain the confidence of the, of the new empire that he had conquered to let them go rebuild their religious shrines, so to say. So that way they wouldn't turn back to the Babylonians. There might be something there. So he's allowing all the Jews to go back and rebuild their temple. 
after 70 years in exile. And so it's really amazing if you look at this reading because it has the theme of um, first sin, destruction, punishment, mm -hmm. and then restoration. And that's, and that's what God wants to do with us. He wants us to recognize our sinfulness, ask for forgiveness, and he wants to completely restore our lives. So there, so you can see the logic of why this reading is here, even though it's kind of funny, Second Chronicles 36. It seems like the last reading you would have for uh, Lent. But the concept of sin, judgment, and then finally restoration is very important because our Lord wants us to really truly recognize the, the grave harm that our sins have caused, to ask for forgiveness, and he wants to restore our lives. And so we want to urge every Catholic to go to confession. It is a precept of the church. Everybody should, should go to confession during this time of Lent. And, and, and there should be fruits from the confession. In other words, the fruit will only be possible if there's sincere repentance. If we truly, sincerely turn away from all form of sin, if, there, if there's true conversion, we will see incredible fruits uh, this Lent. And so the psalm is Psalm 137, which is that psalm that says, you know, by the rivers of Babylon. Do you remember yeah. that song? Let, let yes. my tongue be silenced, even if I forget you. By the streams of Babylon, we sat and wept and we remembered Zion. And it's it's just, a, it's the saddest song in the Psalter. The, the, Israel, the people of Judah are sitting in Babylon weeping because they've lost their homeland. They finally realized when they were taken away to Babylon— the ones who survived, that is, they yeah. finally realized how bad their sin was. And a lot of times people live sinful lifestyles, but they don't realize how bad the sin is until finally comes back to them. You know, maybe they, you know, they, they, they have to face what they've, you know, what they've created or done. And so here they, here they are in Babylon weeping. And their captors are asking them to play the songs of Zion. Sing for us the songs of Zion. And, 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 and so the, the captors kind of want to have some fun with this. Sing for us a song of Zion. Let's hear it. Come on. And here, here they are saying, how can we sing a song of the Lord in a foreign land? I mean, we're, we're out of Zion. If I forget you, Jerusalem, may my right hand be forgotten. May wow. my tongue cleave to my palate if I remember you not. If I place not Jerusalem ahead of my joy. So, of course, with the city of Jerusalem is tied the promises of, of the eternal king, uh, that promise that was made to David. So here they are, you know, away from the land of Jerusalem in exile. And, and they can finally understand pain and suffering of their own sin. Any thoughts on these two, two uh, the first reading of the responsorial song? It's 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 always interesting and good to to know our history, isn't it? So I just just can't imagine yeah. God watching all this happen. Oh my God! It's amazing yeah, if you think about it. it. Really is. No wonder, no wonder he sent Jesus. <laughs> that's right. All right. Well, well, let's go to Ephesians chapter two now. So Ephesians chapter two. And in this set, in this section, Paul's going to talk about grace, mercy, and faith. Yeah. And so he says, brothers and sisters, God, who is rich in mercy because of the great love he had for us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, brought us to life in Christ. By grace, you have been saved, raised, raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavens in Christ Jesus, that that in the ages to come he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in his kindness to us in Jesus in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith. This is not from you. It is the gift of God. It is not from works so that no one may boast. For we are his handiwork created in Christ Jesus for the good works that God has prepared in advance that we should live in them. And so there's some a couple of beautiful things here. Paul's trying to say, we were completely dead 
in our transgressions. Yeah. And we have now been brought to life in Christ. This is all a work of God's grace. And basically what that means, it's a complete gift of God. And now he has shown us the immeasurable riches of his grace and his kindness in Jesus. By grace, you have been saved through faith. Of course, through faith is very important. It's not, he never says no. faith alone. He doesn't say faith alone. It's not a theoretical faith. It's a living faith. It's very important to under, understand. It's a living faith. It's a faith which we continue to live in Christ. And so without a doubt, okay, um, our response to the Lord is not as if it were a contract. Our response to God is in the context of the new and eternal covenant. And for that reason, it's a living faith in Christ. It's just like a marriage. When you get married... You know, it's it, it, imagine if somebody got married and they said, well, I can do whatever I want because now I'm married. And you would say, no, 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 you, you actually are in a marriage. So you have all these responsibilities. And so in the same way, you know, this is great for those who are in this, who are, you know, receiving the scrutinies. But during Lent, we have to ask our people, are, are you really living the faith? Are you are you coming to mass every Sunday? Are you praying with your family? Are you treating people with the love of God? Are you seeking to go out there and share the love of Christ with others, especially with those who are suffering? And we can we can talk about that. Like it's you know what does it mean to really be in covenant with the Lord, and and to use that image of the covenant is is likened to a sacred marriage, and there's responsibilities. John Paul II he wrote a great book called Love and Responsibility. Have you ever heard of that book? He, um, and it's 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 really a classic. It's called. It's not an easy book to read, but the idea that he underlines is so important. That with true love comes true responsibility, mm -hmm. and with and those who have a superficial view of love tend to avoid all the responsibilities. Sure. And so, and so, and so it is with marriage, and so it is with the faith. If our love for Christ is sincere. We're going to live the faith out in the fullest way we can possibly live it out. Uh, we're going to respond. And so what I, what I often say to people is, if this is what Christ has done for us, if he's given his life for us in this way as a complete gift, we will give our life completely back to him as a complete gift. We will respond to the gift in, in, in a similar way. And in that way, we will acknowledge what this gift is. And so look at what he says. By grace, you have been saved through yes. faith. And this is not from you. It is the gift of God. So nobody can say, I deserve it on the day of judgment. Nobody could say, I deserve it. Every one of us will have to say it is an absolute, complete gift of God's grace. But faith is not a contract. So we are his handiwork created in Christ Jesus for the good works that God has prepared for us in advance. And so essentially God wants to work in our lives. He wants he he wants us to cooperate with the work of his grace in our lives. He wants us to cooperate with the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives so that he can truly work in our lives. And so for this reason, Paul says, we are his handiwork created in Christ Jesus for the good works that God has prepared in advance that we should live in them. Okay. What do you think, Deacon? Anything that you would add to yes. this? And for we as Catholic Christians in the sacraments, there's the grace. What a great gift. The, the beauty, especially if we do them well and, and profoundly and beautifully, you, you feel that grace, you know, even if everybody's not totally tuned in, the grace is there. What a gift. Absolutely. And I love how you say the sacraments because, you know, obviously the sacrament of confession, baptism, yeah. Eucharist. But then also as a priest, I look at the sacrament of holy orders. And then as, as a yes. deacon, the sacrament, the sacrament of orders. And, and then for all those who are married, like how, how is their marriage being transformed in Christ? And I, I hope we put that out there. You know, to see Jesus yep. Yep. working through the sacrament of your marriage. Um, and so there's a lot we could say. Okay. Well, now we're gonna, yeah. That's, that's right. right. So now so now we go to John 
uh, John's gospel. So the acclamation yeah. before the gospel is God so loved the world that he gave his only son so that everyone who believes in him might have eternal life. And so very similar to Ephesians chapter 2, yeah. God loved the world. And notice that he gives his son as a gift. Jesus, the, the, Jesus is given as a complete gift that we will either recognize and accept or dismiss and reject. And so have we recognized and accepted the gift? So Jesus says to Nicodemus, and the word Nico, uh, it has the sense of like victory or conquer, and Demas, people. So it could be the victory of the people, or it could be the conqueror of the people. How do you, how do you like that name, huh? Like that. So G Jesus said to Nicodemus, just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the desert, so must the Son of Man be lifted up so that everyone who believes in him may have eternal life. But this is really an amazing verse because he's referring back to Numbers chapter 21, verses 4 through 9, when the people of Israel rebelled against the Lord and serpents with a burning bite were biting the people and they were dying. The word saraf, it comes from the word for burning or the verb for burning. And so these seraph serpents were biting the people with a burning sting, and they were dying. And so the Lord told Moses, make a bronze serpent mounted on a pole and hold it up so that everyone who looks at it may be healed. Now, what is the, what is the bronze serpent? What's that all, all about? Well, the serpent would have reminded them of the serpent in Genesis chapter, two, chapter 3. Essentially, it would have reminded them of sin. And, yeah. and so sometimes bronze is associated with judgment. Uh, but it, the, the concept is they would have been reminded of sin when they saw that serpent and possibly recognized they were rebelling against Moses and rebelling against God. And notice mm -hmm. that when they saw the serpent, they're healed. So there's really something here because it anticipates the cross. He who knew no sin became sin so that we would become the righteousness of God or was made sin. In other words, Christ bore all of our sins so that we could be completely forgiven and become righteous in God's presence. And so the the it's it, it, Jesus essentially refers back to this event in numbers to explain what he will do for us, especially the concept of being lifted up. Lifted up here it's not, it's not referring to praise music. It's referring to being lifted up on the cross, <laughs> yeah. at least the first time. And so, so the Son of Man will be lifted up so that everyone who believes in him, the one who believes in him, will have the gift of eternal life. And then he goes on, he says, so God so loved the world that he gave his only son. And especially the concept of he gave his only son. So that everyone who believes in him might not perish, but might have eternal life. God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world might be saved through him. Whoever believes in him will not be condemned, but whoever does not believe has already been condemned. And so this is really amazing. If you, if you look closely at verses 16 and 17, uh, God gives his only son. The father gives his only son. And he did not send the son to condemn the world. He's giving us the remedy of salvation. And he's he's asking us to believe in his son. And so uh, well, the question that we might want to just pose, have you, have you really sincerely thanked the Lord for this gift? Are you living your life in a way that shows that you truly believe in Christ, that you're truly grateful for this gift? In this time of Lent, it's a time of purification. It's a time where we examine our faith and say, you know what? I need to improve. I need to treat people better. I need to turn away from certain sins. I need to, to get more involved in the church. I need to go out of my way to help people who are suffering uh, in various ways. So it's, it's a time for us to examine our faith. So he goes on and he says that, that whoever does not believe has already been condemned because he has yeah. not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the verdict. This is the verdict. 
that light came into the world. There it is. But people <laughs> preferred darkness. But people but people prefer darkness. And it's really what a contrast that our that God is giving us the absolute greatest gift he could give us, his own son. And many people are saying, no, nah, nah, I don't want that. And then it really, it really tells you something because our Lord says, because their works were evil, for everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come towards the light so that his works might not be exposed. But whoever lives the truth comes to the light so that his works may be clearly seen as done in God. And so it's really a challenging verse. I, I think that in many ways, you know, when you look at this section right here, light came into the world, but men preferred darkness. It really challenges us to examine our lives and to, and to honestly turn away from every form of sin. Uh, and so there's a lot of beautiful conversion during Lent. And a lot of times it it's kind of like a, a gut check, you know, yeah. a, a, dif a difficult like confrontation of where are my weaknesses? Where are my struggles? And the one thing that I would like, to, I always try to tell people is everybody has their struggles and everybody's struggles are a little bit different, but we all have struggles and some of those are lifetime struggles. And we don't want those struggles to get us discouraged or to rob us of our confidence, but we want to confidently bring those before the Lord and ask for his help. So any thoughts that you have on this reading, uh, Deacon? You notice how people sometimes the who have done who have chosen the darkness so much, they get to a point of preference. I like that in the scripture. They prefer this. Wow, what a what a condemnation, right? They have turned themselves yeah. completely around. Rejection. It, it can happen. It can happen. Yeah, what, can. yeah. Yeah. If if one gives in to sin so often, they can they essentially prefer whatever well, that is. You think that's the norm, you know? It's amazing. And, and that's and 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 it's really part of you know the it's really part of the process of dying to ourselves and recognizing that the love that we have received in Christ it's a sacrificial love. It's not a love that satisfies pleasure or desire, but it's a love right. where we make sacrifices and we literally deny ourselves so that we can do His will. But then, th then we discover that this is true love. This is authentic love. This is a love that endures. Okay. The light. the light. Exactly. It's the light. All right. Well, that's it. Well, we we made great time today. Can you believe great we walked job, through? <laughs> we walked through years A, year A, and year B. Yeah, <laughs> for the fourth week of Lent. So, Deacon, would you mind? What is this? Um, what is this? I'm sorry. What is the scrutiny, the uh, ritual and scrutiny this year, this Sunday? Do you know what it is? Rich, yeah, no, I'm I, I'm not a hundred. I'm not a hundred percent sure. I didn't look at it, but I you know that just pray over their senses, right? Think, that's beautiful. It really is. It really is. And I, I think you're right. I think it, I think it is that one. And and it really it's beautiful because. Because the in order to you know really follow Christ, you know, we we die to all those senses in a certain sense. We so touch that, their ears, their eyes, their mouth. Yeah. Absolutely beautiful. And there, and you have a lot of you have a lot of stuff like that, you know, the the rubbing of mud yep. on the eyes and so yep. forth in the yep. in the very in the gospel for year A. Yep. Yeah, there's there's power. There's too much here. There there's too much here, and not enough time to preach on all these things. But there's it's going to be a good weekend. Yep. Would you like to, Would you like to finish with a prayer, Deacon Frank? Sure. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Good and gracious God, may we continue to embrace the gift of grace that you give us, and help us to live in the light, and realize that you are that light. That's that is our salvation. We ask this in the name of your son, Jesus. Father, Amen. Spirit. All right. Have a blessed week. You too. Thank you, Father. Thank you.